Okay, good afternoon and good morning for some of you. We are just starting this uh, Union Symposium to uh, Postvit Geosciences. We will present in detail the co convener at the end of the presentation. And for the present time, we will start as much as, as soon as possible with the first talk. Uh, the general idea is that um, we have this session because uh, the pandemic is a major trauma for humanity and uh, naturally call for scientific based response to it and to mitigate the risk and build resilience. Um, but at the same time, we have also a longer view about this problem because it will be not presumably the last one. And uh, therefore, uh, we want to put geosciences in a post-COVID perspective. Uh, just to give an idea of the importance of the problem, uh, this is a copy of the dashboard of the uh, Center for System Sciences and Engineering at John Hopkins University, uh, which will be discussed uh, later on. And uh, there is, of course, a terrible figure of yesterday, over 3 million of deaths across the world. The first speaker is Dr. Judy Omumbo, uh, who is a specialist in climate and vector-borne diseases. Uh, she is from the African Academy of Sciences, based in Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, she served on several national, regional, and global committees, uh, in particular uh, on the joint uh, COVID-19 task team of the WMO, World Meteorological Organization, and WHO, World Health Organization. She's a co-chair of this uh, task team, and she will present today the first report of this uh, task team, uh, which uh, be on the meteorological and air quality factor affecting the COVID-19 pandemic. I think I'm just in time for the five minutes introduction. And please, uh, Judy, the floor is for you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so as we're all aware, COVID is continue, continuing to ravage the world. And of course, there are questions around being a viral infection, whether there are any signals that we can see in the, in the, in the metrological or air quality factors that may be impacting, may be impacting the epidemic. So in September 2020, the WMO Research Board um, constituted an international multidisciplinary team that was um, established essentially to provide relevant knowledge to decision-making communities on the, the MET and air quality factors that may be affecting the dynamics of this pandemic. So basically, uh, it was to look into what we know of the impacts, um, possibly what we should be monitoring, and for the decision communities, which are very, uh, you know, really important in this pandemic, what could they possibly do? You know, how how can this is, how can data from from the Met services um, and from the climate community assist uh, the response? Okay. So here's the multidisciplinary team, very ably led by Ben Zaitschik, uh, who's uh, on this webinar. And, and uh, we're doing quite a few things since, since that time. As you can see, they're from many, many institutions and many, many parts of the, uh, of the globe. And also very strongly supported by a, a good a team at the Secretariat at the uh, Joint problem, Program uh, at the WMO and WHO based in Geneva. So I'll, I'll go straight away into some of the learnings that have come out of it, the, the achievements of the, of the task team, just focusing on those outputs. So right at the beginning, it was really important to engage the scientific stakeholders. And that process uh, began with an online conference 
we supported an online conference in, in August last year, I think it was August last year, yes, and about more than 400 um, scientists or stakeholders, decision makers attended um, and participated in that conference. It, this was sort of just to launch the exercise and, and to just uh, um, inform the community of what the task team was doing. And then well, around that time as well, there was a submission. We asked them to submit any relevant research and the team also collected any uh, relevant research. And we had a hundred plus submissions of research around, around COVID. Okay. Now this exercise led at the end to the publication of, of recommendations for good, for good practice. And that publication is available there. There's a link in the slides, or if you visit the uh, WMO public website, you can find a link to it. Now, the aim of the task force, of course, as I said before, is to provide policy relevant science. So the task team also put together a list of, of key questions of what would the community be interested in answering. And uh, we followed uh, with a process of distillation of these questions. And out of these questions, 16 questions uh, informed the priorities really for, for uh, uh, MAC factors and, and in, in COVID. And uh, we were able to, to demonstrate a way of, of a good practice in engaging end users to produce the main statements of priorities. There's some examples there, you know, things like through what are the mechanisms of what can we tell about COVID um, MAQ, who is a meteorological and air quality factors from our knowledge of climate drivers, really looking at what we know about other, other uh, the diseases that are transmitted in the same way, viral infections, and uh, how much can we tell from the data and the research that's been done around um, of, of possible impacts of these factors. So the next process, a publicate, next process was uh, uh, the publication um, on, on good practice for, for interdisciplinary research. This was really learnings from the, from the process and it was published in Nature Communications last November. The graphic in here summarizes uh, the process that we use for, for, for uh, developing this framework for the good practice looking at data, doing an analysis, interpret, interpreting it, and really also focusing on the communication, which is the, a very important aspect of it. Now, the main report has fin was finally published uh, in February, February this year, and um, it provides a literature review uh, of all the research that we, we have, um, an overview of the current understanding of MAC, MAC influences on the COVID-19 pandemic, and also the best practices that we that we uh, we learned. So you can see the last. It's been taken quite a, a while. A validation of the report was done in September. Drafted uh, towards the end of the year. It went out for open review. Um, uh, was presented a webinar, for example, in Beijing. The virtual webinar that was held in January, and then finally published in February. So really, a comprehensive process of seeking peer review for it. So what did we learn? So I'll, I'll focus on some of the outputs of, of uh, uh, the, the learning that we've had from that report. So if you look on the first, the first column on the right-hand panel, my, my left-hand panel, sorry. Um, these are the main uh, factors that we considered both from the history and also the understanding of epidemiology of viral infections, temperature, humidity, possible effects of ultraviolet radiation, and also uh, queen, uh, air quality, and the possible mechanisms that these factors may be impacting, the, the virus viability, the host immunity, that's the immunity of the, of the human population, and also human be uh, behavior which is also uh, related, uh, possibly related to, to risk of being infected. So um, what we found is, let me minimize that. What we find is that the temperature may have, I mean, this is, these are all uh, 
possible strong influence from temp from temperature, possible strong influence from humidity, um, ultraviolet radiation. Uh, yes, particularly in around around for host immunity, uh, and also considerations for crowding indoors due to heat or, or cold and precipitation. And then um, air quality factors, which are, are very closely related to, to human behavior. Um, you know, issues like in, in many countries, we find that in, in the cities where the air quality may be lower, there tend to be more, more infections. Now, this is all, a lot of it is based on anecdotal evidence, but there's quite, there is uh, some science uh, that has been found related to that. So what are the key findings? Overall, the results are conflicting. There are a lot of confounding factors which are related to, to human immunity and also to population factors, behavioral issues. Transi transmission seems to be more likely controlled by the interventions that, that uh, governments are putting in, because we tend to see uh, a lot of changes in transmission levels depending on what sort of interventions are, uh, in terms of lockdowns, um, social distancing that governments have put into place. And it's difficult to tease out clearly what the max signatures are. There's indications that the COVID uh, transmission is possibly seasonal based on studies of similar, similar viral infections and the dynamics of those. Uh, it's again difficult to tell. We've only had really one and a little a bit longer uh, seasonal cycle of the pandemic. So it, it's not really clear to, to really understand that, 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 that uh, seasonal cycle. But this, but, we do, but this seems to be what we are seeing. So, you know, many countries are, are, are seeing a seasonal uptick again at the beginning of the year. So uh, additional key findings that uh, include the fact that the impacts that drive season seasonality, they appear to be uh, those that directly affect viral survival. You know, if you're able to kill the virus, then you, you're able to, to control how it spreads. And also human resistance to infection and seasonal changes in human behavior. Labs, lab studies have also shown that the virus survives longer when it's cold and dry and when there are low levels of ultraviolet radiation. And it's not clear, you know, these are based on lab studies, of course, so it's not clear whether this is also true, the real situ the situation in real life. And then there's some indication that air pollution may worsen symptoms and, and increase the risk of, of mortality from the COVID virus. There's no actual peer, um, real peer reviewed evidence of this though. So I think uh, one of the uh, key summaries is that there's still a, lead, a need for a lot more modeling. If you look at some of the re recommendations of this uh, report, um, there's some indications that the transmission is seasonal, seasonal and it uh, suggests that monitoring, monitoring seasonality will become important and perhaps useful. Some additional research needs to be required to expand the data on this, uh, particularly in, in investigating also the confound, confounding factors. Uh, increasing the data record will, it will improve the prediction skill and improve also process based, uh, based modeling at attempt. Additional peer reviewed research is critical. And um, very importantly, clear and improved communication between research and the critical decision making stakeholders. So where are we now um, in the future, what we'd like to do? Continue looking at the evidence, it's still insufficient as we continue to, we need to continue update knowledge and monitor, uh, monitor the pandemic and also engage uh, the decision-making communities more. I think the task team is really looking at how to, to uh, put together a lot more public-faced meetings. And then uh, really focus on, on sharing the information. I think um, over the past, over the first 12 months, 
the, the strong, you know, the strong scientific evidence that supports environmental conditions as drivers of self transmission. And uh, I think that the work of the task, the task force is just, is just really beginning to look at that evidence and continue collating it to make a better reassessment, which we are hoping to do in June. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Judy. Um, you were able to summarize a long report in, in a short time. Therefore, we have more time for discussion now. Um, I'm sure there will be several uh, questions, including from the co conveners You can see that Benjamin is thinking a lot about this report, and he may have some uh, question about that. I certainly do, but I, hear, I see that Jacques has his hand raised, so perhaps Jacques would like to lead off. Well, maybe while, while Jacques works on the live stream conflict, I could ask a quick question of the speaker as a follow-up, because I know this was, Judy, as you well know, this is something that's been discussed a lot by people who have responded to the report, which is about understanding these sensitivities in geographic context. And so there's obviously a lot of work on Europe, the United States, Japan, to some extent, these temperate countries, right? Very data rich environments. Can you comment a little on your perspective on um, what some of the big challenges or, or perhaps opportunities are uh, for improving our understanding of the climatic sensitivity uh, in, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa and other, other tropical regions? Yeah, thanks, Ben. I think for Sub-Saharan Africa, it's important to, it's an opportunity because I think the seasons are a lot more defined. There's not that much uh, variability. It's, it's warm, it rains, it's, you know, the seasons are, are not as complicated as they are in temperate countries. But the big challenge is that there's not much data. There's not much data. So there's, there's mm -hmm. a need to, to, to sort of uh, think about that and work with decision communities to, to put the data together. Uh, particularly now that the now that the uh, um, the vaccination programs are being rolled out, uh, let's understand. I mean, we have we have uh, several countries where we still haven't really seen that that wave of 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 different variants coming in. So where we can we can look at those you know those cent those those areas where the the transmission is relatively simpler and it's relatively more like it was at the beginning. Um, I, I can think of my own country here in Kenya where we are beginning to see variants coming in, but there's still quite a large population where there's just one. I think there are lots of opportunities in Africa to look at that because uh, also genotyping has been done across the continent. And uh, you know, just really working with the decision-making communities, particularly those who provide climate information to, to, to work with the health sector uh, and, and start teasing apart what the seasonality is. Okay, uh, Judy, I got a question from uh, Jacques through the chat box. So his question is the following, UV, heat and dry are in, in, in activity in the virus, but what about the risk to generate variants under these bad conditions for the virus? Well, Jack, uh -huh. that's, that's a difficult question. I mean, I think, first of all, we don't know what sort of extent of UV radiation is, it would, would uh, make a, would actually limit the virus. Um, in the lab, the sort of conditions that are, levels of conditions, uh, levels of, of UV radiation to, to kill the virus are high. I mean, we don't normally experience that in the human population. Um, I think this is an area that just needs to be needs to be studied. I don't know whether Ben has any comment on that. Not not beyond what you said. I think that's a great great answer. Yeah. If there is no question, I will ask a general question. This report is mostly based on a large review of literature, scientific literature, at a given time, of course. Uh, can you give an idea of the amount of literature which has been searched through? So a hundred plus, about a hundred plus, and I think the the literature is still coming in. Yeah, yeah, 
But remember, this is the only only the peer review literature. I think there's still quite a lot that's in the realm of grey literature that it's it's difficult to report on because it is it's not peer reviewed yet. Okay. Um, is there any other question? Okay, probably I will. I would like to have it. Uh, how, when you make the such kind of seasonal variation or the other weather effect study, how about the data quality? Because the data quality is different in the beginning of the pandemic and also different region. So it, it could be difficult to separate the, this, uh, some changes due to the uh, data quality change or due to the real change. So, uh, thank you, Masatoshi. Are you asking about the clinical data or the climate data? The, uh, the, uh, the infection data and other things. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is a perennial problem for all infectious diseases. There's, there's no way of assuring that it's, it's good quality data. Uh, I think many people just rely on what's been provided by the Ministry of, of Health. So that is very country dependent. And you know, there's there's absolutely no way of assuring that it's this quality. I think as the, the scientific community, all we can do is provide guidelines, and then hope that that uh, you know the community the communities pick that pick those guidelines up and use them. But I, you know, I it's hard to say, particularly you know, from my perspective as a health person, that the quality of data have changed at all. I mean, it's 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 either positive cases or negative cases. They tend to be collected from from those who have uh, sought treatment in hospitals or have gone in for a reason because they have symptoms. So it, it, the data, none of the data right through the pandemic have been representative of, of uh, healthy communities or the, or the, or, or the public, really. Uh, are there any uh, normalization project in uh, the yeah, WMO within the WMO. That if we can normalize the uh, data for some way, so that the, the many different scientists can use the same data set, that will be, will help in understanding more. Are there any such kind of project? Well, certainly in theory one can do that, but it would mean um, making countries do field studies. They have to go to field studies select random sample populations that in different settings and, and you know, have standards that are, are applied across the globe. I think practically it, it, it doesn't work. It hasn't worked for other diseases and it's unlikely to work for, for something that is uh, affecting governments so much now that they don't have, they don't have the bandwidth to really do, uh, be doing field studies. Thank you. There's a question asked by Yulia. With respect to impact for COVID in the cities, how to distinguish the impact of air quality from the impact of from a higher density of population? Was that question for me? Yes, okay. Again, the only way to distinguish is to have data from, from those different settings. You know, you look at data in, in the crowded areas, uh, we have to have good air quality data, which I think outside really big cities in temperate countries, there, there, there are not much, there's not much data for that. And um, the fact that populations are so mobile, I mean, you have to have the air quality data taken from the site of infection for each individual. And that is a, an almost impossible thing to measure because people are moving all the time. So we're really looking at air quality data, maybe in homes. Uh, and, uh, that I think would be an impossible task. Okay, thank you very much, Judy, and also the people who raised questions. I think we will discuss more about the, the, the problem which has been evoked, the question of data and so on during the general discussion at the end of the session. So uh, now we can move to the second speaker. Thank you. Uh, we, okay, thank you again. So Theo is uh, the Emeritus Director of the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization in uh, Göttingen. He is also professor of theoretical physics at this uh, same university. 
and uh, he has been re he received different prizes, including the prestigious Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz one, and he's a member of the Academy of Sciences and Humanities of Göttingen and fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, he is very well known for his research on nonlinear dynamics and chaotic system. I met him 20 years ago due to that, and especially about the discovery of Levy walks. Uh, for people who are familiar to Levy flight, it's uh, quite different. Uh, and he has been working in many different physics uh, fields, like quantum chaos and uh, nanostructure, and the spread of epidemic and theoretical neuroscience. And he will present some, his presentation is entitled Epidemics and Human Mobility. So this, this time I'm giving back the screen. Yeah, it's a pleasure to uh, be at this meeting, meet, meeting uh, colleagues again and uh, giving a talk at this winning session. And thanks, uh, Daniel, for your introduction. Actually, I can add that uh, <laughs> I just submitted a manuscript on uh, the swing field in jazz, some kind of psychophysics <laughs> experiment, but uh, that's not the topic here, uh, but it was a lot of fun. Um, now, it's become commonplace that uh, human mobility plays a role for the spreading of epidemics. Um, and so, uh, but how, what, how does it uh, play a role? What does it help to know about human mobility uh, for the forecast of epidemics. Now, there are cases where it actually does not play a role. So uh, for uh, infectious diseases that are transmitted by so-called vectors, uh, where the viruses are transmitted, for instance, by these Aedes um, mosquitoes, um, so like the tiger mosquito here or the Egyptian mosquito, the, the yellow fever mosquito, uh, and they transmit uh, diseases like the yellow fever, the dengue fever, and chikungunya and others. Um, now here, the human uh, mobility doesn't play much of a role because uh, you can only infect yourself in areas where these uh, bees live. So unless you travel there, uh, you will not catch the disease. But that's different. Uh, for the coronavirus epidemics. Um, so in, they have shown that the severity of epidemics can increase drastically as they become transmissible between humans. Uh, it's the case of the uh, different coronaviruses. The, the original SARS coronavirus, 2003, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2. Uh, in all these cases, uh, we know it's very likely that the viruses stem from a reservoir of bats. Uh, they have been transmitted to uh, other animals like the civet, the dromedary, and the pangolin, very likely. Uh, and at the moment when uh, they uh, could be transmitted to humans and between humans, uh, this became a game changer and uh, the disease can, uh, can potentially develop in a pandemic as we have seen. Um, now, uh, the virus can use our human uh, traffic networks uh, for its spreading and uh, therefore it's important to understand the statistical properties of uh, human traffic uh, in order to forecast the spreading of an epidemic. Uh, how the transmission and the spreading uh, are usually uh, imagined is uh, depicted here. Uh, so in terms of overlapping home ranges, so each person has a home range overlapping with others. And uh, so the virus can spread either if somebody brings it to the home range, home range of somebody else, or if this somebody else um, uh, goes to another home range and picks it up there. Um, but this picture was good uh, for the description of uh, historical epidemics like uh, Black Death, 
in the 14th century in Europe, uh, where the spreading uh, is uh, mainly in terms of uh, wave fronts, uh, reminiscent of uh, reaction diffusion equations. Sorry, uh, these wave fronts that you see here. Uh, but what are the home ranges in our modern world? Of course, they are different, uh, as shown here. It's our modern home range uh, based on the aviation network. Um, color coded, light color for high intensity. And so it shows that you can reach almost every spot on the globe within a couple of days. So our modern home range is more or less the entire globe. But we can refine this picture, of course. Not every spot can be reached uh, equally easily. And uh, so the virus will not spread equally fast to any spot. And uh, so this is part of my topic today. Um, first, I will uh, uh, talk about the role of the aviation network for SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. And uh, then in the second part of my talk, ask the question, can we assess human mobility uh, by using proxies? Uh, we mentioned my co-authors, Jack Brockman. He's a professor at Humboldt University and the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin, and Lars Hufnagel, who is at the EMBL in Heidelberg. Uh, the original SARS uh, coronavirus disease uh, started uh, in the Chinese province of Guangdong. Um, the virus uh, arrived in Hong Kong, and from there it could spread uh, to more than 30 countries in the world. And it was understood, of course, very early that this was due to spreading on the aviation network. Now, therefore, let us look in more detail at this aviation network. Uh, again, light colors represent uh, uh, intense passenger transport and dark colors, uh, little transport. Um, first, let's look at the structural properties of the network. And well, maybe the most important one is the connectivity of the network. Let's see. Um, this shows the distribution of the number of connected nodes uh, from one to 200. Uh, and what you can see is there is a strong variability in this connectivity. There are a few, no a few nodes, a few airports that have many connections and there are, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> there, there are a few that have many connections and there are many that have uh, only few connections. Uh, now, this is uh, a variability in the form of an inverse power law. Uh, so you could say uh, this is like a, a scale-free distribution. But of course, it's limited uh, on the left and on the right. So uh, you only have a few uh, two degrees of um, two orders of magnitude for this uh, scale-freeness. Here are some examples. Some examples, uh, Frankfurt and Chicago. Frankfurt uh, has many connections, as you can see here. And Chicago, oops, sorry. Ch Chicago has a uh, comparable capacity, a number of passengers, not many more, uh, but has much less connections. Uh, now with this, uh, Aviation network, you can uh, uh, model the spreading of an epidemic, for instance, in an agent based uh, simulation, uh, assuming such a chain of uh, uh, Markov chain, if you wish, uh, with uh, uh, waiting time distributions for the infection 
to onset of the disease and the waiting time distribution uh, for the time between onset to admission to hospital and so on. So if you do this, uh, as shown here, then you can uh, forecast the, the spreading of the uh, virus, uh, uh, which is shown here in B down here, the simulation after 90 days, uh, and uh, compared to the WHO reports also after 90 days. And this is color coded according to the number of cases that uh, showed up in a given country. And you see, uh, it is relatively uh, accurate. I mean, of course, there are fluctuations, but uh, it is accurate in the sense that you can predict which countries will be affected most and uh, which countries will not be affected as much in an early stage of the pandemic. Now back to SARS-CoV-2. Um, one can predict the most probable aviation spreading route. Uh, and uh, this was done by Dirk, um, starting in uh, Wuhan, as we know, you can also use other starting points. Using the aviation network, uh, predict the most probable uh, routes of uh, spreading, that is uh, on which airline connections, to which airports, uh, and from there to which other airports. Now, uh, the, one can um, transform this uh, network uh, into a, a network where you have an effective distance uh, between the, the different airports. The effective distance also depends on the strength of the connection. Now, using this, um, one can uh, and, and then this is shown here, the effective distance is shown along the vertical axis. And this is also related to the arrival time of the disease uh, at another uh, metropolitan area. Now what you, and that's shown here for different um, continents and different colors. So green is the US, uh, the, uh, the Americas and uh, uh, Asia is violet, Europe is orange. Now, um, what you can read off here already in this image is that the largest, the, the areas with large airports are affected first. So, Lax, Frankfurt, JFK, uh, Charles de Gaulle, uh, Daniel. Um, so, and then uh, the small airports are affected much later. And this is also something that we've observed already in, in SARS-CoV-1, uh, where we quantified uh, this effect, uh, looking at uh, the largest, the 10% largest airports uh, and the 90% other airports. And, what, and this is shown here in uh, infection time in days. And uh, what you can see here is that the largest uh, airports uh, spread the infection much earlier than uh, uh, the smaller airports. So uh, large cities trigger infections and this can help us also in the development of vaccination strategies. Um, Okay, but modern travel occurs on all length scales, uh, not only on the aviation network, uh, but also uh, by cars, uh, by trains, etc. So, how do we get uh, statistics on on uh, this on the human mobility that also uses these these means of transportation? Um, well, there used to be data by the American National, National uh, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. And uh, formerly they just had, could ask people uh, where, if they traveled from A to B, where do you come from, where do you go to? 
And of course, this led only to a very poor statistic that wouldn't help us much. Uh, and therefore, we were looking for other means of getting more data. Uh, and uh, so, uh, can we assess the statistics of human travel also on smaller scales? And we were the first who pioneered the use of proxies for that purpose. And how we did it? Well, um, follow the money. Uh, this is here uh, a dollar bill. The dollar bills have the serial number. And this dollar bill also has this stamp track me at worstgeorge.com. This is a website. Uh, here you see other such dollar bills where people have registered uh, these dollar bills with their serial number that you can enter here. Also the zip code where you got this dollar bill. And this way, this database has more than 300 million uh, dollar bills meanwhile. Um, and uh, well, we use this database to extract the trajectories of uh, dollar bills and of people that transported them. Uh, so we have the uh, reports of the position at some time T1 and the report of the position of the dollar bill at some later time, we, we, had, we had the uh, total number of trajectories of 11 million. We didn't use all of them, uh, but uh, I'll come to this. Um, we can do, do two things with uh, these data. One thing is we, we can use it for uh, agent-based uh, simulations. I mean, we have, um, the travel statistics between all uh, counties of the US. And uh, we can use this uh, for just for simulation. And we've done this, uh, for instance, for the swine flu, um, uh, predicting the spreading of the swine flu. Um, but here I want to look at some other properties. I actually want to study the mathematical properties of, of this um, human traveling. Uh, this can be used in cases where we do not have such uh, data available, but we still have the mathematical equations. So uh, we can look at, uh, we looked at, uh, to get the trajectories, we only looked at uh, events where a dollar bill was reported twice within three days. So in that way, we could be sure that it didn't travel uh, twice uh, between the two reports. Uh, and this shows uh, the length distribution in kilometers uh, log log. And what you can see is an inverse power law and the exponent is minus 1.6 for this distribution of length distribution of jump length. Uh, but there is another distribution, we notice that the probability of being reported at the same site once again, after a time t, uh, is also an inverse power law. So this survival probability also decays in the inverse power law with an exponent minus 0.6. Uh, and based on this, I think I should hurry up a little bit. Uh, based on this, we uh, we build a stochastic model with, uh, um, with jump lengths delta x and distribution for them and waiting times delta t and their distributions with these exponents alpha and beta. And let me get to the final result here. Uh, uh, the, uh, from this model, um, a lady walk uh, model and continuous time random walk description uh, led us to a simple diffusion law, um, but a bifractional diffusion law with a fractional derivative um, with an exponent alpha. And this is, uh, well, some kind of generalized diffusion coefficient and also a fractional derivative with respect to position with an exponent beta. Okay. Now, uh, and this could actually be confirmed by a data collapse here for this typical uh, scale-free uh, solutions of this uh, diffusion loss. And this is actually confirmed for the whole data set uh, of the 11 million uh, 
uh, trajectories we had at that time. Now let me switch to uh, more uh, other uh, proxies that one can use. Of course, meanwhile, we use uh, mobile phones as proxies. Uh, although in Germany, it's not so easy due to data protection. Uh, the first uh, one who uh, managed to get such data was uh, Barabasi and his group, Marta Gonzalez and Hidalgo. Uh, and you can get other information from uh, uh, cell phones as proxies. For instance, uh, on the number of positions that an individual travels, uh, and that's shown here, number of uh, 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 different positions traveled goes up to 50 even, but only in a very few cases. And, uh, and this is the probability that uh, an individual travels uh, to one up to 100 positions. Now, um, finally, uh, back to COVID-19, uh, of course, now it makes no sense uh, anymore to use uh, the aviation network or uh, to use mobility for to break the spreading now that it's prevalent in, in, in most countries. And, uh, but um, cell phones can help us to um, extract other information on human mobility. For instance, Dirk again has um, uh, determined the change in mobility in Germany based on cell phone data. Uh, compared to 2019. And what you see here over a year is that a year ago in March, uh, the mobility dropped considerably by 40%, but then get back uh, slowly again in summer, uh, even exceeded. And now it's, it, it didn't get back in Germany to these minus, minus 40%. So this tells us somewhat about, uh, a little bit about the compliance of people. Um, and another very actual uh, topical <laughs> uh, information is contained in this uh, data set, because as you might know, in Germany, um, our parliament uh, in a long fight, a long political fight among many idiots, uh, but finally our, our parliament decided about uh, the lockdown measures, uh, this uh, um, national lockdown measures this week. And uh, in particular, uh, there will be now a, a curfew um, among these lockdowns, a curfew between 22 hours and, uh, and 5 a.m. in the morning. And one can look at the mobility average over three weeks in March in Germany by daytime, uh, so over the hours. And what you can see is that 64% um, uh, 64 million, so 90, uh, 92% uh, of the mobility happens during daytime and only 7.4% during nighttime. So this tells us that uh, a curfew will not reduce the mobility much if it only happens at night. Uh, but so you could wonder whether it will have much of an effect, but I I still believe that uh, the curfew will have indirect effects by uh, suppressing uh, parties or reducing the number of parties. Now, um, I think my time is over, I should stop here. Um, I will skip this. This is a recent unpublished work of ours on um, open populations, endemic diseases in refugee transit camps and nursing homes and so on. I think there's no time to go into details of this. And I resume, uh, understanding human, human mobility is key for understanding and containing the epidemic spreading in the early phases and anonymously tracking proxies, banknotes and mobile phones can provide important information. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, we have a few minutes, two, three minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. No, no, it's fine. Um, is there any quick question? Yeah, if there's not, a question from the question uh, go box. Ahead, go yeah, ahead. Question box uh, asking that the 
Uh, where this mobile phone data come from? Is that from the company or that just he want to ask the question? I can hardly hear you, but um, so the mobile phone data. Uh, Nowadays, different people use mobile phone data. When uh, Barabasi uh, started this, he kept it secret. It was just too, too dangerous. He actually got criticized a lot in forums uh, at the that time. Um, it was kind of um, at the boundary. <laughs> and so he didn't, he didn't say uh, in the science paper where he got the, the data from. Uh, meanwhile, like in Germany, uh, one can get data from uh, T-Mobile, for instance. Um, but of course, they are anonymized and uh, one gets uh, only reduced data. You don't get, um, you, you can follow, for instance, when an individual leaves one cell, telephone cell, and enters another telephone cell. So this is what is recorded. So. Uh, the information we get, at least in Germany, is very limited. Probably the Chinese authority have, have more uh, uh, information on cell phone data than we get in Germany. Okay. okay there Thank is you. another question uh, yeah. asking about uh, instead of mobile phone, uh, the, is it uh, possible to use a uh, seismic data uh, to check the mobility. Uh, I didn't get the second part of your of your question. Is it possible? Uh, the seismic what? data, the other type of the data, for example, the the the, uh, the seismic that kind of uh, the noise on the, due to the traffic. Can you use such kind of data for the mobility? Uh, I'm sorry, the, it's very bad acoustically. I couldn't get your question. <laughs> Can you get what kind of data? Oh, seismic data. Seismic. Ah. Okay. Um, I'm, I don't know how you would uh, get human mobility from seismic data. Uh, I, well, I know how you can use uh, bird mobility to predict the seismic data. <laughs> this is actually done with uh, 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 with sensors on the birds, but I don't know. I have no idea how you could use the seismic data for human mobility. Okay, uh, one more question uh, about the super spreading event. Uh, yeah. How much is it? Uh, affected by this mobility, the super spreading event. Super spreaders. Um, well, as um, super spreading can have two, uh, two aspects. One is just uh, the number of uh, travels that a person um, undertakes. Uh, and the second aspect is uh, that a particular person uh, can transmit a disease much more easily than other persons. So there, there are two aspects uh, when you talk about super spreading. Uh, the first aspect, the second aspect, of course, cannot uh, be dealt with in such a model. But uh, the first aspect it, uh, can be handled uh, by the cell phone data, for instance. Uh, I showed you this distribution, I, mean, I can show it again, uh, where you see uh, the number of different locations visited by uh, individual people. And uh, so that's what you can detect with uh, cell phone data, but, but not the, say, how infectious a, a particular person is, of course. Okay, now new question come uh, that uh, how the uh, a flight ban stop the further spread or is it too late? How does what? <clears throat> I'm a bit afraid we are out of time. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I propose to take this Not question. Loud enough. I'm tuning up my loudspeakers here, <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> okay. 
we will come back to this question on the during the general discussion because we have to move to the next speaker yeah. with Jack de Mongeau. Uh, just a short presentation. So Jacques is president of the French Society of Theoretical Biology. He has been director of different uh, CNRS laboratory. CNRS is the Center for National Research in France. And uh, he has both uh, medical expertise and uh, I would say uh, uh, physics expertise, which is uh, something very special. And uh, he has been working on many topics he has been, for example, the chief of the mission of system biology and complexity of CNRS and uh, involved in a large uh, French Japanese project and so on. And uh, his presentation will be about the geoclimatic, demographic, and socioeconomic determinants of the COVID 19 prevalence. Jack, the floor is for you. Okay. Uh, but I will speak about some uh, variables. Uh, these variables are uh, companion of the, of the COVID, of course, and uh, you can distinguish epidemiologic variables, very well known. Huh? You can uh, get uh, data, for example, from sites like uh, Worldometer or uh, Johns Hopkins, you, you know that, or it's the daily new cases, cumulated cases, and uh, daily death numbers. And uh, you can calculate from that by using uh, different approaches. The basic reproduction number of zero, the effective reproduction number, the initial slope of the autocorrelation function, if you are using an ARIMA uh, time series approach, uh, or if you are uh, <laughs> using uh, the raw data, you can calculate, for example, the initial slope of the log linear regression of the exponential regression of the daily new uh, different waves. The socioeconomic variables, uh, bon, the given variables you can fa find in some uh, sites from World Bank or OECD side, for example, are GDP health expenditure percentage. That is the percentage of the GDP devoted to health expenditure. The consumer confidence index, that index related to the, the confidence of uh, consumers in the market, in the general market, and the Gini index, which is a kind of uh, inequality uh, index. And from that, you can calculate uh, the social health index, the ratio between the GDP health expenditure and an also index, the social fracture, uh, which is signing uh, the difference between the income of the rich people and the divided by the income of the 10% of the, the lowest, uh, uh, the poorest uh, people. Uh, the demographic variables, well, the given variables, you know that, you can uh, get uh, them from World Bank and OECD, pyramid of age, uh, birth and death rates, density, and the calculated variables are the median age of a country, the relative uh, death risk, that is uh, the risk to die from the disease divided by the natural risk to, to die. And uh, geoclimatic variables are uh, well, essentially given variables. You, you know that you, you can get from a weather atlas or climate tents, uh, since temperature, humidity, elevation, uh, sunshine hours, etc. Well, uh, the phenomenal approach uh, allows us to, to get uh, the epidemiologic variables. Bon, the ARIMA time series description is easy to describe. Uh, you are uh, attempting first to stationarize uh, <coughs> the signal, the variable. The variable is, of, for example, uh, the daily new cases. And you can, after uh, subtracting a trend and um, a cycling uh, component, you, you are trying to express the uh, daily new cases at the G uh, in terms of uh, a, a combination, linear combination of the daily new cases at this G minus K plus a certain noise. 
And the Arima, for example, the Kuwait, I have just uh, calculated uh, in uh, red the train and uh, the red the stationary is a black uh, signal. And by playing with that, we can bon, do, of course, some forecast and uh, <coughs> also study in the, this uh, black curve in the stationary, uh, you can study the different coefficients relating the new cases, for example, of, uh, in, in a, a, a FADE, <coughs> relating that to the new cases uh, uh, of in days uh, G, G minus K until a day R, and R is called the degree of regressivity of the, of the IMA. Alors, very often we are um, using a historical a phenological model. It's a model by Bernoulli. It's in, in fact the logistic, and Bernoulli has invented the logistic uh, by uh, modeling the variola epidemic in uh, 1760. And from that, uh, there is a lot of, uh, of studies, but practically all the ideas are in the paper of Bernoulli, uh, a big paper of 80 pages. Uh, my adv advice is uh, for you is you, you have to read absolutely this seminal paper. And from that, it's relatively easy. We have done that with uh, the Bordeaux team, with Pierre Magal, finally to uh, try to, fit the, the data, the, this data are the daily new cases. And after that, of course, uh, you have a good approximation uh, only by using this logistic uh, Bernoulli uh, approach. Uh, it's very easy to fit the cumulative uh, data, country by country. Alors, the discrete modeling is giving something uh, different. Uh, if you have an estimation of the R0, and if you have, for example, data about uh, the way <laughs> in which uh, the zero uh, patient is contaminating progressively, uh, Theo has uh, shown that uh, the other uh, the patients. If you are taking into account the length of the contagious period of an individual, in fact, you can uh, play with uh, more precise reproduction numbers during the contagiousness uh, period, you have each day uh, a local, a daily reproduction number. And R0 is only the sum of this uh, daily reproduction numbers along the contagious period. It's an interesting uh, parameters. And for the often in many countries, we are uh, recovering this uh, V-shape uh, uh, structure for these daily reproduction numbers observed for many uh, respiratory diseases like influenza, etc. You are more contagious at the beginning of the contagiousness period. <laughs> there is an improvement, and you, you are at a new level of contagiousness after uh, some, some days. Alors, bon, we, we can study that for uh, all countries, and uh, you have uh, four uh, different uh, groups of uh, countries, some uh, biphasic, like influenza, some decreasing, some inverted biphasic, some in increasing uh, along the increasing the reproduction number along the contagious period. Okay. Geoclimatic, it's an example of. Uh, Uh, variables, uh, here temperature, elevation, density, and median age. It is possible uh, by studying all these data to do some uh, statistical uh, analysis I will give now. Alors, the geoclimatic factor, uh, our first, uh, uh, we have published that in uh, February or March in, in biology la last year. We have observed that the gradient, the northeast southwest gradient of temperature in France was exactly uh, represented by the region in France in which the occurrence of uh, the disease was, was very high. And in fact, the public health policy in France has followed the occurrence of the disease. 
And uh, we were, for example, the 3rd of May last year, we, we were uh, in, in a lockdown, in a geographic lockdown, respecting uh, the, the gradient of temperature. Of course, it was not based on the temperature, it was based on the occurrence of the, of the cases. And uh, by analyzing France region by regions, by looking at the mean temperature uh, of these regions, in fact, uh, if you were co uh, calculating the Pearson uh, coefficient of uh, <coughs> correlation, in fact, well, it's, it was for uh, each uh, uh, six days in March, etc. Uh, the correlation was uh, was significant. Alors, if you are putting uh, all the heat here, uh, the uh, OECD countries. Bon, you have a gradient for uh, the, uh, if you are looking the, the annual temperature, uh, we have the same kind of, of gradient we have observed for the, for the French region. Well, what is strange, if you are comparing the, the first wave to the uh, second wave, uh, the correlation is negative for the first, and positive for the second. And uh, it's a bit uh, difficult to, to comment that. And we are trying uh, in countries changing a lot uh, their uh, occurrence of uh, daily new cases like Rwanda, for example. We are trying to relate that to the climatic change in this, uh, in these countries. But, we have to do this analyze couple of first wave and second wave data country by country. We have not finished this, this work. But it, it apparently uh, uh, between the two, uh, these two waves, we, 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 have a, we have a big difference. Now, the demographic factors, you know that the mortality is depending on the age, huh? the young, the, the old people. Uh, and if you are looking at uh, more 80, uh, patients, uh, the death rate is growing until uh, 15%. It's, it's very, very huge. And if you are considering this median age, for example, uh, for the first wave, uh, there is a, a positive regression, and uh, in which, uh, for example, uh, countries like Iraq having um, a convex, a, a very young population. Uh, before the demographic transition, you have the shape for the pyramid uh, of age. Uh, Iraq, of course, has uh, uh, in the first wave a small, uh, if you are considering the slope of the log linear regression of the daily new cases, bon, this, uh, uh, slope is small, and uh, in in countries in which you have uh, uh, after the demographic transition a lot of uh, median and uh, uh, age uh, age class represented in the pyramid of age, by you have the, the you 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 observe. Alors, not for the first, but for the second, you 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 observe the the, the contrary. And it's, it, it's, the, it's the same. It's uh, this uh, difference between the first with a positive uh, uh, regression coefficient and the second with a negative regression coefficient is uh, a bit strange. In, you have absolutely to enter in the couple of uh, uh, data, data obtained for the first, data obtained for the second, country par country to, to interpret that. But uh, uh, see, for example, here for the second wave, the regression coefficient is significant. It's min minus uh, 0, uh, 0.42. And for the first, it was also well, practically the same, but positive. Alors, of course, it's very um, tricky because in order to render Take into account this uh, data, you have to complicate the model 
for example, uh, if you are playing with uh, uh, the McCormick uh, model, you have absolutely to, to divide at least into two classes, the old and the young. But uh, here we, we have, in order to uh, estimate the different coefficient of this uh, Bernoulli, McKendall, uh, Ross, uh, etc. model, it's, oh, it's, it's difficult to get the, the data. Very few countries are giving the data H class by H class. Now, the socioeconomic uh, factors, that is uh, the gene index. Alors, the gene index is, uh, roughly speaking, uh, a distribution curve. Uh, if, for example, all people have exactly uh, the same income, uh, the curve is uh, like that. Uh, it's a distribution function uh, uh, representing the, oops, I'm sorry this part of the, of the square. If uh, there is a good uh, repartition of the income, the, the curve is diagonal. And in fact, in general, you have that. And uh, by uh, estimating the area of this uh, difference between an harmonious repartition and a very inequal repartition, the repartition corresponding to that curve, but you have a certain uh, evaluation, quantification of the inequality. Alors, the, this uh, gene index is, uh, oops, sorry, I have a problem with my, oh, I've changed something. Uh, why I cannot? Oh. Yes. Uh, alors, if you are looking at the repartition of the Gini coefficient in Europe, you have, of course, uh, many differences between uh, between countries. Uh, this uh, repartition. Uh, indicates, for example, uh, some uh, countries having a, a good repartition of the richness hmm, on the north, a bad on the south of Europe, and in the middle, of course, it's in between. The consumer confidence index, well, I will pass rapidly on that. Uh, alors, the, the GDP health expenditure, uh, it's uh, the percentage of L expenditure, uh, the percentage of the GDP you are dev devoting to the health. And it's the same, there is a, it's a bit similar the repartition to the Gini repartition. And uh, some countries here in between have uh, the six percentage very important and the uh, the, the major uh, country is unfortunately uh, France. This uh, percentage is equal now to, to uh, practically 50%. Bon, the US are the champion with uh, 18%. Alors, if you are using, for example, this GDP uh, health percentage, uh, if you are using that with the epidemiologic variables, and if you are uh, doing just a, a PCA, a principal component analysis. In fact, you see that the GDP health will appear in the principal component two, and the other are uh, dispatched into, uh, for example, here is uh, the second D, it's the second wave uh, slope of the log linear regression uh, curve, and uh, we can analyze the components and with three components, you are explaining practically 60% of the variance that is considered as good. And if you are considering all countries, the developed and also uh, developing countries, uh, you observe uh, a positive correlation between the GDP and the uh, first 
uh, wave slope that is the way uh, in which you are uh, uh, accelerating in the exponential phase of the first wave. If you are uh, looking only on development countries, uh, you have the same uh, uh, kind of, uh, of uh, observation of, uh, of regression. If you are looking at uh, the second wave, it's different. You have the same phenomena of difference between the first and the second wave. In the second wave, the regression is giving a negative, uh, a negative coefficient. Alors, for, uh, if, if you are uh, using not the initial slope of uh, the Loglin regression curve, but uh, the maximum of R0 observed during the, the first wave, uh, but you have for developed countries for the first wave a positive regression, and it's still available for the second wave. Alors, if you are looking at the, all the countries, you can divide the countries into two groups of countries. Uh, the first group is a group containing France, Norway, Denmark, etc. Uh, in which, uh, if you are looking on the, on the PC1, on the principal component one, in fact, uh, you have uh, essentially uh, uh, negative uh, um, uh, coefficients in the constitution of uh, the linear combinations of the PC1. It's exactly alors, for the six countries, Kazakhstan, etc., Moldova, Ukraine, Belarus, a certain, uh, it contains a certain quantity of countries coming of the, uh, the USSR, ancient USSR. It's, it's exactly uh, the contrary. And it's probably due to the fact that uh, the health policy are completely different in these blocks of, uh, of countries. Alors, you can introduce the other uh, uh, GDP health percentage, uh, uh, socio-economic uh, uh, variables, the consumer index, the Gini index, etc. That changes a bit. Uh, bon, the explanation is perhaps a bit better uh, by looking to the three uh, first PC components. Alors, these first components are now essentially uh, the Gini, the income and uh, for, for, of the poorest, 10% uh, of poorest people income of the 10% uh, richest and the social index you can uh, construct from that. Uh, the variance is essentially concentrated on these variables. Uh, yes, the conclusion. Ah, oui, the, uh, uh, practically finished. Bon, we can from that uh, also, uh, la, like in the first uh, analysis uh, group, the uh, countries uh, by in, in, in clustering uh, using the, the PC result component and France, for example, is with Norway and Finland in Assam. Alors, the, the perspective, there is public health policy variables. Huh? also to take into account, you, if we could uh, do benefit, benefit risk analysis in risk groups, but we have absolutely no data. Huh? The, the best analysis is analysis by crossing age classes and comorbidity classes, no data. And of course, to do this analysis for each variant. Huh? I have done that by mixing the, the variant data, but uh, we have to, to enter in the detail. Well, it's a teamwork with many people who has published, etc. About uh, 16 uh, uh, papers. And OK, I have finished. I'm sorry to if I have passed the time. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, we have only a very short time for a quick question. There was one in the Q&A. Okay. which was about uh, the modeling of variants. In fact, you mentioned a little bit that in your conclusion. 
Yes. Alors, the, the, the problem of uh, the variance is very interesting for the, the forecast because uh, the variance, for example, is useful to detect the rupture point into uh, between the waves because the modeling now is excellent for the, the waves huh, by using classical approach. But in between the waves, due to lockdown and other um, public health policies, you have period, purely stationary periods, with, with a, a either a big R0 or a small R0. And in order to detect uh, rupture uh, points, time, it's time points, huh? uh, between the date at which a wave is finishing or at which a wave is uh, initiating, is starting, I have not told about, but we are using the variance. The, the variance is a very, very important, uh, the, the variance of the, of the raw data is a very, very important uh, statistical uh, parameter too. Okay. Um... If there is no immediate question, we will move to the next talk. But in any case, during the general discussion, we will come back to several questions okay. related to your presentation. Thank you, thank you. Okay. I'm sharing the screen now, just to present Lauren. So Lauren Gardner is associate professor at John Hopkins Whiting School of Engineering. And she's well known as the creator of the interactive web based dashboard, and which has been used by many, many people, including me and other researchers all around the globe, and which tracks the outbreak of the novel coronavirus. Uh, and um, there is a record of about uh, 3 billion of page views. Okay, she briefed the Congress about that. And she was named among the time most time 100 most influential people of 2020 for uh, democratizing data and filling a void of public health leadership during the pandemic. She was also including on BBC 100 women list to 2020 and other ranking like that. Uh, she's a specialist of uh, mobility in spreading uh, diseases. But she was a more holistic approach and very various diffusion, taking into account climate, land use, and other contributing risk factors. Our uh, presentation will be on tracking COVID-19 in real time, challenges faced, and lessons learned. Okay, the floor is now to Lauren. Okay, as soon as she <laughs> to get rid to. Okay, to leave the, the screen. So, Lauren? Got it. Um, all right, thanks so much, Daniel, um, and for the introduction and the opportunity to, to speak here. And like Daniel mentioned, I'm, I've been leading the mapping and data collection efforts behind our CSSE dashboard since we started this in January of 2020. So it's it's hard to believe it's been about 15 months at this point. Um, definitely not what we expected, I think, at the start of this. Uh, and so I will talk today about the evolution of this dashboard and some of the processes that we put in place and like Daniel mentioned, challenges that we've faced along the way um, and some suggestions for moving forward as well that we've taken away and learned through this experience. And I'll try to get through it a little bit quickly so that we have some time for questions afterwards. All right, uh, so just to make sure everyone's on the same page, if anyone's not familiar with uh, this dashboard and these efforts, we've been tracking cases, deaths and recoveries on this dashboard. Um, now for about 15 months, the spatial resolution varies. So for the US, for instance, we collect data at the county level, and then it goes all the way up to the country level and with quite a few countries at subnational levels, which are equivalent to a state province level. Um, and so altogether, this is about, there's about 3,500 points or locations on the dashboard, and we're collecting multiple variables, which amounts to about 10,000 variables an hour that we pull on a continual rolling 
um, timeline. So it's a pretty substantial data collection effort. And there's all sorts of other pieces and map layers that are provided as well, which is all interactive. And, um, and importantly, all the data that we pull and push onto this dashboard is made publicly available. And, and so what I wanted to focus on is kind of why we did this and, and how we did it. Um, and one of, and why we did this is actually kind of twofold, but one of the things which I think aligns well with the talks that have been in this session is that my background is really not in collecting data, it's using data. So I model infectious disease spread and risk and addressing a lot of the same kind of data and concerns and research questions that were posed by this, the talks before this. Um, and so I'm really interested in understanding emerging infectious diseases, novel pathogens, what's going to happen, um, especially in the earliest stages. And so I'm very acutely aware that there's a big gap um, and need for this type of data. And it's important and necessary for making evidence-based decisions and guiding policy, especially again, early on. And so this new kind of these new cases of pneumonia that were arising in China back in December, January, were something that piqued our interest. And with my one, one of my first year PhD students who is from China, his friends and family were being affected by this um, directly. And so we were following and tracking these new cases and collecting this data internally and decided to just start building out a dynamic data set and sharing it publicly so that people like myself and groups like us and other users could um, in the infectious disease community could have access to it. And so we actually decided to do this one day in January, making it public and build the map alongside it to visualize the data that we would be collecting. And so we actually built the prototype for the whole dashboard that evening and shared it the next morning. And that was really the start of this whole effort. And it was just two of us for a while running this thing. Um, and that initial architecture supporting it was also very simple. So this was a time where there was no public health dedicated pages to COVID data. So we were collecting data from kind of untraditional data sources. WHO regional offices were posting about new cases on Twitter and Facebook links, for instance. Um, there were news and media articles all over the place. So we were really kind of aggressively trying to manually track what was going on and push this data into the dashboard and also into what was a Google Sheets at the time. Um, and in some ways, we were also getting information back to us through some crowdsourced efforts. So no one was able to update the map themselves outside of our group, but because of the attention it was getting, we were getting informed through communications of new cases as they were occurring in real time, and we could validate those and add them to the map. So this we started when there was just a few hundred cases in China and only a couple countries outside of China that had reported a case or two. So it was feasible to do at the start, but clearly was not a sustainable process as the outbreak grew like we all know it did. Um, and even in just that first week, we started getting a lot of attention for what we were doing. We had you know, a few hundred, a few thousand hits the first day up to 10 million hits by the end of the first week. And so the dashboard was really already starting to be picked up and relied upon by international and um, domestic media um, and individuals and, and data users all over the place. So as this was growing, we kind of saw this exponential increase happening with the outbreak itself and also with the interest and, and demand on the dashboard. And so we knew we had to re-strategize. And so we teamed up with a, a larger group, um, most critically with Esri, who was the um, generators of this, the mapping software that we were using. Um, and they helped support the visualization infrastructure. Um, and then the, at Hopkins, we have a lot larger team, which went beyond my group at Center for Systems Science and Engineering um, and included the Applied Physics Lab at Hopkins, which really helped us build out a much more robust and resilient data pipeline to start collecting this data as it was becoming available and more and from more and more sources. And so we upped this architecture and the kind of next stage of it 
was really focused on two different things. One was expanding our source set. So, you know, from the start, we were doing these kind of ad hoc sources as things were being reported. Um, as, as actual authoritative sources began reporting on this data, we needed to be collecting and pulling data from those. And so we began quickly seeking out and expanding the source set by identifying them and validating them and then also automating the whole effort. So obviously we couldn't continue to do this manually. Um, and so we needed to automate this data collection process and develop scrapers and pull this data and collect it and clean it and curate it before we would push it out to both um, the dashboard and also just to the GitHub repository in general where it was hosted um, and could be pulled by any interested party. And so this architecture was obviously it was automated, it was much more sustainable, but there was still a lot of challenges with it because there was still this manual error recovery process um, that we were dealing with where we weren't able to really um, automate the reading in the data and, and validating it through the system. We had to still do that manually. Um, and so this was happening while everything was just still expanding and growing exponentially. Um, and so we went again from hundreds to thousands to millions to billions of hits on this dashboard a day, which was happening back in March. Um, I, and um, this demand was again coinciding with spread from you know one country to four to now close to 200 different countries. And like I said, we're pulling from about 3,500 different locations independently for the data on this dashboard. And the users were also really broad. Um, so we had individuals that were utilizing this data directly through the interactive dashboard um, and pulling it from the GitHub based on access to it and exposure through the media, through all the different social media platforms. Um, but the dashboard data was also being relied upon by you know, our highest heads of state. And I exemplified by one of my favorite photos of our dashboard photobombing Mike Pence on the HHS, wa HHS watch floor back um, early last year. And, and so while it was really great and exciting that the data was providing this public service and providing this public good, it posed a lot of challenges for us. So on one hand, I mentioned the error recovery. So the data was being updated so quickly that new um, kind of delays in our reporting or corrections of even an hour were kind of being, were being fed back us, to us um, through different different platforms through through the media, for instance. And so these were happening faster than we could internally detect and correct them. Um, and then at the same time, there was a huge communications challenge around what we were doing. We had to deal with issues from things like how do we report data for locations where there's disputed territorial boundaries. Um, we had issues around naming conventions. Um, and we had issues with just false accusations of us putting this data behind paywalls for when there was just delays and outages for technical difficulties. And so trying to continuously communicate issues around what we were doing and also just clarifications was almost a full-time job alongside this. And this was all again being done while we were just kind of almost this volunteer group trying to provide this public service. Um, and so we knew with this growth and exposure and demand um, that we needed to continually update this, this architecture, which we are still very much doing. Um, and so again, we continue to this day to expand the data sourcing. So we are going from lower to higher spatial resolution in a lot of places and seeking out subnational data um, and, and pulling data from the most authoritative sources for any place that we're reporting for. And then we have a much more resilient pipeline to pull this data and collect it and curate it into an open source, um, open data product. And there's a couple critical components that are in here that we've developed. And one of them addresses that error recovery that I was mentioning earlier. We have this automated anomaly detection system that we've built from scratch, which reads in those 10,000 or so points an hour and looks for patterns to identify which ones may be error prone and holds them back for manual recovery and validation before we push them into the open data product. Um, and these errors can come from all sorts of different causes from 
up, uh, upstream data entry errors at the actual sources, um, or because websites change the structure of their reporting and therefore we may read in a variable and assign it incorrectly. Um, and so we try to detect those before they go they go public. And we also have different data fusion logic in place because of some of the inconsistencies that we've encountered with the actual data that's being reported. So this is something that again, is still very much in development. Like this experience I keep saying is like building a plane while flying it in a lightning storm. Like it's just all being done in real time. And um, and it's, it's very messy. And so we're continually kind of band-aiding this um, this pipeline to try and make it work as best as possible. And, and so that's the system that we kind of have in place. And we started with this case and death data collection effort in my center, which expanded in terms of the team, but it's grown into a much larger effort by Johns Hopkins, um, which is hosted under the Coronavirus Resource Center. So this was built around our data for tracking coronavirus, but is expanded to be a huge collaboration across the university that also looks at um, initiatives around testing and contact tracing and vaccines as well as looking at um, providing analytics and insights into just generally what's going on with COVID. And the data uses to date are, are really broad. I think to date we've kind of, this data has served a lot of public good, which is really exciting. Um, really surprisingly to me, I guess, well, not now, but at the start, I wasn't expecting it to have such a major role for the general public. And so this data is accessed and accessible by individuals all over the world. They can get it directly from the site. It's integrated into things like Google Maps to help inform individuals on the risk in their kind of in their surroundings and help them make better decisions at an individual level. It's obviously integrated into mainstream media. So it's, you know, lives on CNN 24 seven and it's, it's relied upon by a lot of other major media sources and, you know, NPR, Wall Street Journal, um, et cetera. Um, and then I think really, for me, excitingly, it's it's really being used to drive public health policy, and it's being relied upon by research groups all over the world. Um, and so, for instance, the CDC Forecasting Hub uses this data to both um, build and validate the models that contribute to this the COVID forecast. Um, and so, my group's also actually one of the contributors to these forecasts. So we're not only generators of the data, but we do also use it. Um, and then internally in our group, we're using this data for all sorts of applications as well, um, trying to understand some of those, the questions that have been brought up in this session around the role of, you know, human mobility and land use and climate and um, sociodemographics and human behavior and the risk and spread of COVID. So just a couple more things. One of them, um, I think it's probably obvious to most people, but I just wanna kind of hit on this, like why this effort has been so hard. And the reason it's been so hard is because standards matter a lot in these, in these data collection processes. And we've been living in an environment that completely lacks standardization. There's inconsistencies and um, instability across the board in this, what we're trying to do. Um, on one hand, there's, variations in the data structure and mechanisms in which this data is being provided. It's not always provided in machine readable formats. There's retrospective reporting happening all the time. And we're seeing a lot of that in the US right now as there's audits going around on the death counts and there's being new cases and deaths that just get dropped in at different points in time for different locations. Um, and this makes it really hard to get a good understanding of what the actual epi curve looks like, what's actually going on with this outbreak. And, um, at different stages in time. There's discrepancies in the numbers reported amongst authoritative sources, which is really challenging and disheartening. So in the US, in a state like Texas, the state of Texas on their dashboard will have one number for a certain county, and the county might say something different about itself. And these are really challenges to distinguish between and decide what we should be reporting. Um, again, it's a pandemic, so there's time of day and frequency reporting that varies by location all around the world. And then really critically, there's huge ambiguity in parameter definitions that we're collecting. So, you know, what's a confirmed case? What's a probable case? How do those vary by location that we're of reporting? Are cases and deaths um, reported based on, you know, when, they're, when the tests were done, when the, when the actual infection actually occurred, or when the report 
uh, was made available to the public. Um, there's new technologies, so confirming cases using different types of diagnostic versus antibody tests provides a huge challenge. And of course, tracking recoveries is just a huge mess. Um, and so we really need to be able to be kind of nimble to address and detect these kind of challenges and when changes occur and then respond and react to them. Um, and so I think, you know, it, all of us, I think, think this already and know this, but there is really a huge need for open data principles and standardization to support these kind of events. Um, we need a standard reporting system and, you know, not for COVID alone, but again, for emerging infectious and notifiable diseases across the board. Um, the data needs to be standardized and made available publicly in a way that's actually actionable. So these are spatial and temporal scales that prove useful enough to use for planning and modeling purposes. Um, and they need to be provided in a really timely manner in machine readable formats as well and in a systemized fashion so that these kind of efforts to centralize and aggregate this data in the future can be done much more efficiently and effectively. Um, and then just lastly, I, I get asked this a lot and I, I have thought a lot about it is why we were so successful in doing this. And again, this is the fact and why there was such a demand for doing it in the first place. So I don't think there's gonna be a world in the future where this kind of information isn't just available to everyone when something happens. Um, but it was surprising that it felt like that was even a gap in this day and age. Um, and so I think some of the reasons we were really successful in doing this are one, we acted really early. So at, coming from my background and just knowing the value of this information and this data, and also having the personal interest from my group, um, we, we acted within, you know, essentially days or weeks of when there was just some first hint of a problem. And, and our guiding principle from the start was really open data and open science. So not only were we collecting this because we knew it was important, but we were collecting it and making it available to anyone that wanted it in a format that was easily accessible and usable. Um, a second thing is we we're really lucky to do this in a very supportive environment. We had funding available from the start, which let us continue these efforts as they grew exponentially in an uninterrupted fashion, which would just not have been feasible if we didn't have that support. And so this kind of support really needs to exist. Um, and there needs to be a, a better mechanism for science agencies and, and governments to financially support these efforts quickly when needed. Um, we also, Again, I was really lucky to be surrounded by people that are so capable with the technical skill sets that we needed for this work. So these were engineers and computer scientists and software developers and spatial analysts and, and visualization experts that um, we relied upon. And these skill sets really need to be standing um, skill sets that are invested upon and integrated into public health agencies as well moving forward if we wanna have high quality data available to us in a timely manner. Um, and then a the last thing that I think is, is really interesting is we were you know, a private institute doing this uh, just on a voluntary effort, like I said, and so we really had the freedom to make executive decisions in real time on how things should be done. There was no bureaucratic internal approval process we had to go through. And, and that can definitely potentially pose some challenges and, and be problematic. But I think this was really critical in the early days when things were changing you know, hourly, daily at least. Um, and we could just make decisions as it was happening and, and do something to provide this information and share it. Um, so I know not everyone has the luxury of working in that kind of an environment, but I think that if there are better open data standards and infrastructure and processes in place to make this information available, then it could a lot more cleanly and efficiently be collected and shared publicly in a timely manner um, by, by other groups as well. Um, and so this is to uh, effort by me. It is a huge group effort. Um, Frank in Chengdong, um, who goes by Frank, I just want to highlight who really kind of pioneered this effort from the start. Um, and then it was led by my team and the Center for System Science and Engineering and our close kind of collaborators now across the Applied Physics Lab, also the Sheridan Libraries, um, and then again at Esri as well. And so this group of people is, is 
includes all the core people that have been involved from from the earliest days and none of them have slept near as much as they should have in the last years that's for sure um, and then I also just want to acknowledge some of the support that we've had for this and this is from industries philanthropies also the science organizations that have been supporting our research that utilizes this data as well so um, hopefully I left some time for questions and I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen now Thanks. Thank you very much. Of course, it's very impressive what you have done with your group. And um, I really enjoy your conclusion, which were not only limited to what you have done, but for the future, raising important question of, about open data and the requirement to, to be done. Okay, I'm sure there should be some question. Yeah, two participants raised their hands. Uh, who are they? Ah. The first one is the previous one. So okay. the only second one. Yeah. Uh, Jacques de Mongeau is the first, maybe. Yeah. Uh, no, no, please. <laughs> no, okay. Theo, you are the first. Oh, well. <laughs> they are scared by Lorraine, I believe. <laughs> So okay, the question, question is that uh, do you have uh, uh, any collaboration with the WHO dashboard? Yeah. No, we're we're not working together on that. Um, I know that our partners at Esri, the the spatial modeling um, software, they are working with WHO. So indirectly through that, there's been a bit of communication, but they're completely independent efforts. Um, so we're really doing. They, they collect data differently through their kind of on the ground organizations that they have in place. Ours has been purely through collecting publicly available data directly from each of the different locations, countries, states, cities um, that we pull it from. So it's done completely independent. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, well, thanks very much for, for giving us these insights into your extremely valuable work. Um, and um, I'm a little pessimistic. Uh, I understand that you, you call for uh, standardized reporting systems and that would be extremely valuable. But when you see what's going on within Germany, we have 16 different states and health issues are um, are not federal, that is uh, ruled by every st state individually. Um, and even within Germany, the report doesn't work. They, uh, they are still using faxes <laughs> to, to report to the uh, Robert Koch Institute. And uh, this, this makes me very pessimistic that we would be able to get this standardized on a on a global scale and also uh, you need politicians for that and when you see uh, I'm just looking at what happens in Germany uh, they they are unable uh, to 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 get together to take uh, decisions for 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 Germany as a nation but every prime minister acts uh, as he wants and not listening to scientists they, they say they are listening to scientists, but they also have uh, other, um, other aspects to take into account and so on. And, and then they do what they want. It's, I'm pessimistic that we, we, we will be able to improve that soon. Yeah, well, uh, given the last 15 months of my life, I share a lot of the same frustration um, with you. And I hear you about Germany. I'm in the US, specifically in Texas right now. So I will just say that we share a lot of the same concerns on that front. We have 50 states and over 3000 counties and they do things differently. Um, and so, you know, I kind of can say, this is a huge problem. We can't get alignment anywhere. How are we supposed to know what's going on? 
Um, so we have to try to do something. I think there's organizations here like the CDC that could, you know, that you know, should not be political that could enforce some standardization. And they've been trying to do better lately, but it needs to be in place earlier. Globally, I agree. It's a huge challenge. Things are done differently. Techno different technologies are available. Are available. Surveillance systems are different. Um, all that we know is that the way we did it this time, like we just shouldn't do it this way again. It does you know, it was so, it doesn't make any sense. So we need to do something better. And I hope we use this experience to kind of drive and move that way and baby steps at least um, to be able to get a better understanding to compare apples to apples. Because right now pulling data from different countries um, is, I think in this group, we're so interested in what's going on globally on a relative basis and trying to understand things like the role of climate. If you have to have some good understanding of what's happening in one country relative to another. And if you don't have access to the same kind of reporting, then you know it's impossible to actually draw accurate conclusions about what's going on. So I, I hear you, but I think it's something that just, it needs to be worked towards. Um, yes, have you access to some hospital data coming from COVID patient files? Because in Johns Hopkins, you have an excellent hospital information system built mm -hmm. by Professor Marion Ball. Have you access to, to this? Uh, this, yes. So some, definitely there is a great connection with the hospital systems in the university. That's completely independent of our data collection efforts. Um, this map has no individual level data. It's all anonymized, aggregated, publicly available data. Um, individual level patient data is just such a different realm in terms of, of using that and sharing it. So it's, it's not part of this project at all. Right. No, but you, you could play with them uh, without rendering them public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, using that kind of information to understand more specifics and contextual things like demographic distributions and age and comorbidities and underlying. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, that's being used. It's just, again, it's not going, it's not part of these larger scale kind of global data collection and mapping efforts, but hospital data across the board is being um, collected and provided in aggregate anonymized forms. And I think HHS has the best version of that for now. We were working with COVID tracking project previously but, and put to put up hospitalization data. But you are not filtering this data. You are receiving that after a filter done by hospitals or public health services, et cetera. Absolutely, that's a huge thing. Everything that we put up, we cannot say that it accurately reflects the real world. We can only say that it accurately reflects what's being reported publicly. We absolutely can't go validate what Spain is saying about its COVID patients. So yeah, that's not, yeah, that's not our role, right? It's centralization of the best data available, but that's it. So, and I, I kind of feel like that's really important. And then that's the first step. And we're not in a position to try and adjust and filter it to say what we think is really going on. That's a modeling project. And you need to know, you know, everyone needs to know what the, you know, same ground truth data is before they can work with it and then make their own assumptions and adjustments for whatever modeling purposes there are. But yeah. You are right, but for benefit risk studies, you probably need this information. Uh, yeah, definitely. And I hope people are taking our data and then doing that to, sh to share it. And I know in our group, we do a lot of that. We use the data and we post-process it to do things, to put in some models, to do uh, decision support and predictions and forecasts. But again, I feel like that needs to be done in a second stage so everyone has the same baseline information. Yeah. Thank you very much. If there is no other question, I have one, uh, which is a bit more optimistic than the point of view of Theo. <laughs> uh, is the fact that the data becoming public, there could be some feedback to the providers who suddenly cannot hide big uncertainties. For example, in France, we have two main public institutions to give the numbers for, for play of deaths. 
with a difference of 10%. Mm -hmm. It was not public until now, now it's public. And I believe this, uh, what you have done helped a lot to maybe to create some difficulties to these uh, hidden facts, because mm -hmm. now they are not too much hidden, they are a little bit public. What is yeah. your feeling about that? Yeah, I think we caused a lot of people a lot of headaches um, with doing <laughs> this. Absolutely. And we we talk directly to these public health entities all the time. We coordinate with France all the way down to like Harris County, Texas, trying to understand when they put data out that we think doesn't make sense, what's really going on, how should we be doing it, how should we be reporting this, and trying to align it with them, but saying, you know, there's these inconsistencies we're seeing um, and working through it. And it's also a huge issue when they do big data dumps, and then we need to figure out how do we back distribute this. Um, so yeah, it's, I, th I think you're right. I think it just it just brings to light a lot of the things that we're not doing well. That hopefully yeah. some of them will start doing better. Okay, thank you. Um, there is one question from Sheila. Uh, ah, can Yama. this data uh, give any information about accuracy and uh, uh, efficacy, efficacy of the test and trace programs? Uh, I, that's a big question. I, I think that yes, it could, but it would require lots of kind of second stage data collection and modeling to do that and, and actually collect all those other, um, all those other variables, the tests, the technologies, um, for different locations to understand how they're doing things and, and what's really accurate. So the data alone doesn't answer that, but it could be used in those in those kind of, to answer those kind of questions. Okay, if there is no other specific question about uh, the dashboard and the open data policy, which has been set on by uh, Lauren on his group, our group. Um, well, we can move back to the other questions which were not fully answered in the short uh, discussion and to have a more general discussion. Uh, for example, I believe Yama, you collected a few questions which were raised by people about the variants. Yama? Oh, yeah. okay. Well, I can't it. It. Yeah. Sorry? Yes, the, 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 the question uh, from uh, the uh, Anu, that question is that the, the can flight ban stop the further st spread? according to your model. Yeah, this is a question to Tia. This is for Jacques or Theo? Yeah, or yeah, yeah this is, I think this is to Jack, yeah, actually. <laughs> now, the, the, the variance is take a bit into account in the principal component analysis, you know, but, but, but uh, in general, we are reducing the information and expectations and the other moments <laughs> like uh, uh, variants, QNS, etc., are not taking sufficiently into account. I agree with you. But by introducing tools like uh, principal component analysis, I think we have the way to reintroduce the variance as a major parameter, statistical parameter. Okay, and then also another question from uh, Bernard Hoing uh, the, uh, to that Theo that uh, can, uh, can we model how the variant have penetrated to the Europe through the, yes. this flight? Yes, uh, I was just gone and for some reason I was interrupted. Um, uh, so in principle, yes, in principle it's possible to model this. But uh, I guess the data that one has available are not very accurate. Uh, imagine, actually this reminds me of uh, a coin sp spreading. <laughs> uh, um, empirical study that was done in Europe um, because uh, originally, similarly to what we have done with uh, reverse charge and dollar bills, um, the, there was a, a study on coins, on European uh, Euro coins, where um, 
the, the different coins were issued in diff differently in different countries. So you could see the origin of a, of a coin from which country it came from. And so of course, after a while, uh, all this is mixed up. But uh, so in, in a certain transitory phase, you could study this. So that, that's just an analogy. Um, here, I think what one needs in order to model this uh, accurately, of course, is um, the, the, uh, the transport between different countries. And uh, this changes on a daily basis. And it, it is different in different, even in different states. Imagine we have uh, three, four uh, states in Germany that have borders with France. And every state has, a, has a different uh, rules for, for, uh, for entering uh, Germany from France. And so getting these data accurately would, will be difficult. Otherwise, it's possible to model this, of course. Okay. Um, if not, not any question, I have one uh, for, I believe, uh, more or less all the speakers, uh, especially those who are using uh, stochastic modeling. Uh, is it so easy to, uh, to deal with, uh, um, how to say, the decision makers arguing with the help of stochastic models. I'm afraid they are more interested by deterministic models. So what is your experience about that? Well, uh, they are looking to our forecasting 90% uh, uh, intervals, etc., cetera, uh, with a lot of uh, curiosity, but I think <laughs> They, they are not using this, uh, <laughs> our models because this, they are saying, of course, uh, the cone of uncertainty is very large. And uh, they, they are not really understanding what is representing uh, uh, the forecasting uncertainty uh, interval. And uh, bon, I, I think they, they have a culture, a statistical culture, very, uh, very small and very poor. And it's, it's a problem of uh, stochasticity. But the statistics are stochastic, but uh, bon, it's probably bet bon, better or uh, uh, easier to understand what is an average. I mean, the variance is a bit more complicated. <laughs> and after that, if you want to enter really in an ARIMA, in a time in series modeling, it will, I think it's. it's, it's they haven't the culture for me in France. But, but the president is apparently learning a lot. He's saying he's uh, learning <laughs> epidemiology, yeah. mathematics, and we can hope in the future he could uh, understand okay. all from our models. Could I, I have my own question to Roland and Judy that uh, is it possible to get the data of the time of the day when it is in Could I still answer the question before? Excuse me. Okay. Uh, the, uh, uh, I have a question to the Lauren and the Judy about the, uh, if we- I still have an answer on the previous question. Uh -huh. Yeah, they would like to answer to the previous question. Yeah, well, okay. um, as you might know, in our country, we have a chancellor who was trained as a scientist, actually, actually as a theoretical physicist and theoretical chemist. And um, well, she was very open uh, and she still is. Uh, and uh, she acted very early on in, in, in the pandemic in last year in March. Without her, it would have been much worse last year uh, but uh, so there there are open ears right now at the very top of uh, of our nation uh, but it's the the federal system that is and and the fact that uh, we have election in in many states that make it so difficult uh, right now this year 
Um, and uh, of course, only a few people are able to, to make sense out of this stochastic uh, modeling. Um, but our chancellor does, that's uh, for sure. Okay, thank you. Any other comment about this question? Dr. Merkel has to teach our president in the domain yeah. of stochastic. <laughs> you cannot say it. Okay, Judy, about that, do you have some feeling about uh, how to deal with uh, decision makers about uh, modeling with these different types of modeling? Yeah, I think it's not just for COVID, but for any, for any types of diseases, they, they're really anything that's the word uncertainty means that for them means that it's you don't know the answer so they won't use it <laughs> no, it's too bad <laughs> yeah. yeah i think statistics are difficult for you know the non-statistical population in general and i think you know governments uh, decision makers often they expect to be sure about doing something because there's always some funds attended, uh, attached to it. So if there is uncertainty, then they, they would rather not make a decision rather than, than make one and, and be accused of something later on. So the answer, I guess, would be no, not really. Okay, thank Yama you. Yama was asking something oh. about the, site, the time of day. Yes, if you can get the data that the infection time, because normally the infection data is when a day of the infection, which day infection happen. But if you can uh, get the date estimate of the time, uh, the time of the infection, then you we can really see that the fit time we should ban for going out or whatever. That so such kind of it is. Are such kind of data available, or is that possible to get such kind of data from any source? I, th I think Yama, that is is this close to impossible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nobody knows the, the winter period, and you you know that you're infected when the symptoms start to show, and that's possibly four days afterwards. There's no telling what time of day that is. Yeah, I think. You. I think providing daily data is actually dangerous. I, I tell everyone that uses this that they should be smoothing it at least over a week for multiple reasons, just issues of reporting of cycles over the course of the week and the way testing's done, the way health, you know, test public health authorities are actually providing data. I mean, I wouldn't trust anything coming out that said it knew what was going on on an hourly basis. I barely trust things that say what's going on on a daily or weekly basis. So. Um, but if you find that, let us know. That's great. <laughs> now, if you have, for example, only one zero patient, and if you have an ideal transmission, it's possible to extract from the sequence of the daily new cases number, the uh, daily reproduction numbers corresponding to each day of the infectious period. It's possible. That is called the fever. As it, it's a general Fibonacci series, and it was able to extract. But there is a lot of noise. Yeah. The data are not precise. There is no zero patient. There yeah. is a mix <laughs> between many clusters, etc. Yeah. Alors, this ideal problem is I totally yeah. I totally <laughs> agree that you can, in theory, do all of these things. The thing is that the data that underlies the the models that you need to use is so noisy that there's no point to making daily predictions for anything, I think. Um, but yeah. Um, Daniel, I just have a quick question. I am going to have to drop soon. I wasn't sure when this ends. I thought it was. Um, we, to finish, uh, we are a little bit behind the, the schedule, about 15 minutes, and okay. we have to stop. I would suggest that now we will uh, ask to the convener to present themselves. They, I will give uh, them the floor and uh, I will share the screen with them. Before that, I think the main conclusion we have is that uh, we are only at the beginning of something very important. But uh, OK, so, something was done, but there is much more to be done. And that's the reason there are two other opportunities to discuss that during this conference, I will mention that briefly. 
In any case, we have first to thank all the speakers for all what they have done. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'm sharing the screen with uh, what is the last slide. Oh. So if Alexander can say two words about himself, that would be nice. Okay, I can see you. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel, and thank you for, for speakers. It's really a very interesting uh, presentation and uh, uh, good achievements. Uh, uh, I'm Alexander Klanov and uh, uh, I'm working for Science Innovation Department of WMO here in Secretariat and also professor uh, affiliated uh, uh, at the University of Copenhagen. And uh, my field is uh, modeling of atmospheric pollution and meteorological processes. And so first of all, I just would like also to highlight one issue what was not touched. Actually, uh, most of presentation, especially uh, this uh, first WMO uh, research board report uh, considered uh, impact of geophysical factors and meteorological and air quality factors on disease uh, with COVID. Uh, but uh, we have also to remember what uh, this pandemic and especially lockdown period affected on uh, many aspects uh, uh, on geophysical uh, factors. In particular for the BMO, a very important issue a quality of forecast and observation system, uh, which was also uh, one of the other group uh, is analyzing at WMO and to minimize impact of, uh, 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 for example, reduce of uh, uh, observations from aircraft uh, during this uh, lockdown period and uh, a reduction of flights uh, on quality of forecast. Another group uh, of the uh, uh, Global Atmosphere Watch uh, a program is analyzing effects of lockdown on uh, atmospheric pollution. It was also quite interesting uh, results and uh, uh, Professor Soki, who is uh, leading this group, is now preparing a, a big overview uh, a paper with, I think, more than 200 papers analyzed uh, there and uh, uh, will be published soon. So it would be good maybe next time to uh, also uh, ask them to uh, uh, consider. And it's uh, many different uh, impact and, and different uh, directions. For example, for ozone, it's opposite to uh, particular matter and for uh, greenhouse gases. So uh, it's also an interesting topic to, to, to discuss. Of course, now we don't have time, but uh, just yeah. uh, highlight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid that Paul Bourgin is not present and the same for Stefano Tinti. Paul Bourgin is the head of the UNESCO, UNESCO unit win on complex system and uh, it's interesting to pursue this uh, question with uh, the help of UNESCO so you will have some news in short time about that. Uh, Stefano Tinti is uh, from the University of Bologna and uh, is a physicist uh, mainly dealing with seismicity so it's too bad he could have better answer maybe to the question of seismicity and uh, uh, I don't remember the COVID discussion, I think, or signal, okay. And uh, on the contrary, Benjamin uh, Zachi from John Hopkins University is here. So if he wants to say a few words, that would be nice. And just briefly, Daniel, and I, I wanna thank you and the other conveners and, and of course all of our speakers for a very engaging session. I think you summarized it appropriately that there's been tremendous effort made and, and so much more work to be done. So I'm sure we will be continuing this conversation um, in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Gabriele Manoli from UCL London, University College London. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Gabriele Manoli, I'm lecturer at University College London. As I would like also to thank you, you know, the speakers and the conveners. I really enjoyed this session, it was uh, amazing. And I particularly enjoyed the discussion on uncertainties, right? And how we should communicate and deal with it when trying or to inform policy or decision makers. I think it's really an open uh, challenge. And I guess it's a you know, very interesting discussion that we can definitely continue. Uh, during the next sessions and town hall meetings uh, in the coming days. So thank you everyone, really, really enjoyed today.
Thank you, Gabriele. Klaus Friedrich from Hamburg University. He was around. Klaus? Oh. Klaus? Yes. Okay, let's see. Let's Does see. It so, Does yeah. it work? Uh, okay. So, first, and we can hear you. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I try to, to do, do the video here. Okay. Thanks to all the speakers. I really very much appreciate that. And what comes to mind with the last talk is that there may be an example for a positive outlook, like the WMO has been created in connection with weather forecasting. And if we add data analysis associated with that, and so worldwide, we have a, a really good data network, uh, which works tremendously. And it could well be that WHO could do the similar thing. Plus, we need an intriguing start for politicians. And politicians maybe uh, have two problems. First, they do not really believe in weather forecasting, although it's very good. And secondly, uh, maybe we need a next generation. Okay, okay. thank you. And uh, last but not the least, Mosokoshi uh, Yamuchi. Okay, I, I, okay, I'm a quite different field. I'm a space scientist and then uh, doing the data collection and the data analysis. But the, the, from both data collection and data analysis, the kind of common background of anything global data. And the, the corona data is really such kind of global data. So. Uh, but my feeling is that is the more scientists from the many different fields, if it is handling the global data or regional data and also analyzing data, that would be uh, important to think about the corona, even if it's off time, on time, doesn't matter, such kind of thing. Then that is my background. Okay, thank you. And I just want to mention that we have two opportunities to meet again. One is the town hall meeting on Wednesday afternoon, 5.30, and which is mainly about the engagement of the geoscience communities. Uh, by geoscience, it should be the, the term should be ta taken in the large sense, anyone who is concerned a little bit with geo, so uh, almost anyone. And uh, there will be the day after, an interdisciplinary inter session ITS1 on COVID-19 pandemic, health, urban system and geosciences. And there will be 26 papers with a wide diversity of topics which will be presented there. And of course, we are thinking about a special issue to keep track of what has been done today and during the next two uh, uh, manifestations of this year at the uh, EGU. If no other remark, we are closing the session. We are just a little bit late, 20 minutes, or oh, 26 minutes late. Okay. But it was very great, I believe. Okay. So thank you again for all. <laughs>